think we'll go ahead and get started here. Thanks everybody for showing up this Thursday afternoon. I know a couple of people have made turns in the next few days, so we appreciate you taking time away from, from studying and outlining and doing all that. This is going to be a wonderful presentation and discussion um, today. So um, we're very fortunate to have Professor John McGinnis from Northwestern University School of Law in Chicago here to talk with us. He's going to be making the case against using international law in American court jurisprudence. Um, something that's kind of a neat topic um, to think about because it doesn't usually get taught in many of our core classes here. So this will be a nice little discussion to kind of prepare you for some of those issues you might encounter in common law or some other courses. Um, for those of you who are new to the event, um, or new to the Federal Society in general, our mission statement um, at the national level and then at William Mitchell here is that we are a nonpartisan, conservative, libertarian organization dedicated to fostering balanced and open debate about the fundamentals of, um, fundamental principles of freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federal Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect on the law and public policy. Um, our membership at the national level is um, over 40,000 now. That includes professors, lawyers, judges, and even members of the state, um, Minnesota State and United States Supreme Court. So we're very fortunate to be in that company. Um, we as a society take no position on any legal or public policy issues. Instead, we just like to have an open debate about those issues and kind of let those ideas um, float around. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the William Mitchell Federal Society, um, there was a sign-in sheet outside there. Um, I think it might be floating around here. If not, we need to sign up. Um, we'll send out emails about our upcoming events, happy hours. Um, if there's any networking opportunities, if occasionally we hear about job applications or internships, clerkships of that sort, we'll let you guys know about that. If, you know, if you're interested, if not, don't feel obligated. Um, and now to the reason why you're all here, besides um, the wonderful song, Tasting Pizza, Professor John McGinnis. A little bit about Professor McGinnis. Um, <laughs> almost. Um, he's a graduate of Harvard College and earned his law degree um, from Harvard Law School, where he's well, one of the editors of the Harvard Law Review. He has, also has his master's degree um, in philosophy and theology from Balliol College in Oxford, England. Professor McGinnis currently teaches, like I said, at Northwestern University School of Law in Chicago. His areas of expertise and scholarly work include antitrust law, constitutional law, international law, trade and transactions, as well as law and economics. Professor McGinnis was, um, has clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. He served in the, um, as, as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice from 1987 to 1991. He has a number of books that he has written, including two that are coming out this year. Um, they are called Accelerating Democracy, Transforming Government Through Technology, and one that comes out very soon, Originalism and the Good Constitution. Professor McGinnis has been in the Federal Society for a number of years and has always been a friend of the Society. He was a winner of the Paul Bader Award given by the Federal Society to an outstanding academic under the age of 40. He has been listed by the United States on the roster of panelists who may be called upon to, de to decide World Trade Organization disputes. So it is now my great privilege to welcome Professor John McGinnis to discuss the case against using international law in American jurisprudence. Professor. I'm delighted to be here to talk about this topic because I think it's both an important theoretical topic but an important practical topic. So let me begin by talking about how international law is already being shaped, used to shape our law. And then I'll describe the reasons I'm generally against that. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, uses international law to, in, in times to interpret our Constitution. International law was used uh, 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 as a, uh, one of the arguments uh, to suggest that the juvenile death penalty is unconstitutional because there's a consensus of nations against that. Uh, moreover, just as we speak, there's an issue that's, uh, that we are in interrogating uh, a, a accused terrorist in a, um, a ship off of Libya who was caught. There are many people, uh, not actually the Obama administration, but there are many law professors and human rights advocates who think that is illegal, not because it violates U.S. law. We're not. Uh, going to use this information in court, and so it doesn't violate Miranda, but because it violates some uh, provisions of international law, international human rights law, and international law of the war, even though it's not part of our law, or Congress has not made it part of our law. 
So those are two examples of how international law either does or has argued that it should shape our law even though our political branches or our constitution hasn't actually made it a rule of decision in the United States. And my talk today is going to be to argue that's a mistake. While our branches should be complete, uh, Congress, uh, the President under delegations of Congress, should be free to bring in international law as a rule of decision that's binding on our courts, uh, the, uh, they should not otherwise be used as a rule of decision. In other words, unless our political branches make that decision, international law should have no uh, effect on binding uh, our uh, executive branch officials uh, are members of Congress. And let me describe the reason for that. We might ask, well, why should, is that the case? We could, we could, one way we could, we could go and just look at the list of international law, the list of U.S. law when it conflicts. We allow interrogation in these circumstances to find uh, evidence of terrorist conspiracy. International law, the argument is, does not. We could try to figure out which is better in which case, and if U.S. law is generally better, we'll go with U.S. law as a general matter. I don't think that's very productive, because of course people disagree about what norms are good. I think the way to look at the question is, is our process for creating law better than the process for creating international law? And I'll argue that it is. First of all, I'll argue it's better for Americans, and then I'll make a little more complicated argument that it's actually even better for people who aren't Americans, that we follow our own law rather than international law when the two conflict. Well, first of all, what's good about our law? I don't have a long time to describe that, but essentially that it's democratic. And we could discuss a lot of for a long time why democracy is a good thing, but two arguments have often been made. Democracy is a good thing because it groups everyone's preferences. Everyone gets a vote and the majority uh, 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 wins through some uh, process. So it's likely to represent our preferences better than other um, uh, mechanisms. Moreover, it's also better because it represents a diversity of views and it's thought that uh, we're more even likely to get factual decisions right if we, have, if we look at it from different angles. So that's what's good about democracy, and what's good about the mechanisms for our law. Let's compare that to the mechanisms for making international law. And I think the problem with international law is that it's in no way democratic. It has nothing really to uh, counterbalance that lack of democracy. Indeed, there are five democratic deficits of international law. So I'll list now these five democratic deficits of international law. First of all, you might wonder what international law is. I don't know how many of you have taken international law. May I show of hands? One, okay? <laughs> well, let's look at international law. We'll begin with customary international law, because as I've said, I don't have any objection if we make international law part of our law by treaty. What is customary international law? Well, it's law that nation states all around the world, or at least almost all of them, accept as a rule of international legal obligation. So it's a rule about nation states, not about people. And I think that's the first democratic deficit. After all, law, the law should be about the preferences of people, not nation states, and not all nation states even represent their people. And so that's the first democratic deficit of international law. A second deficit is, you might think that requires, that definition requires all these nation states to say, we agree with this norm of international law. We agree you can't interrogate an accused terrorist. But that's not true. International law doesn't even actually require the consent of nation states. It often just requires them not to object to some rule that's been put out by some international body. And the failure to object, I think, compares very unfavorably to our structure. Members of Congress can't put a law into effect by failing to object. They've got to affirmatively vote for it. And there's a good reason for that. The reason, of course, is that otherwise, uh, uh, people will not be accountable. And so that's uh, uh, a real uh, defect 
of international uh, law as well. Well, another defect of international law, a third defect of international law, is um, uh, the fact that uh, uh, international law, even the agreement of these other nations to make international law part of their law, it doesn't even follow that they're going to follow international law in their countries. Unlike the arguments here, where if we accept international law, we've got to follow in our own countries, many other nations never follow international law, even if they can agree to it as a matter of international law. So it doesn't become their domestic law. If that's true, international law becomes so much cheap talk. So that's another reason we should be doubtful about it. The fourth international de defect is how international law is formed. How do we find international law? It isn't necessarily written down anywhere, but it's just about the practices of nation states. Well, there are two ways, and both of them have deep problems. One is people go and look at treaties, treaties that the United States may never have ratified, like the Rights of the Child Convention or the um, uh, international covenant on economic and development rights. And they look through it and see, well, that's evidence. If everyone signed up, or if this has been an international treaty, uh, that uh, uh, that's a uh, uh, international norm. The problem with that is many of the nations that have signed up to these norms, they these nations that negotiated the Rights of the Child Convention, were uh, totalitarian nations, either China, or members of the Soviet bloc. And so that really should suggest that these, these kinds of treaties may have been a, 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 an agreement, a compromise with the nations representing uh, the free world. And that means that any individual provision there, we really can't be very confident that it's going to be good. So that's, that's a part of the difficulty of finding international law creates a democratic deficit. Now, of course, not all norms are written in treaties, and so the question is, how do we find norms that don't even exist in some treaty? And, and as I say, this, these treaties the United States never ratified, so we didn't make them part of our law. But there, that's a real problem, because then we, how do we make that decision? Well, one way, and I think the most important way in international law is publicists decide what a norm of international law is. Now, you may wonder what a publicist is. It seems like a fancy-sounding word. Well, in the modern world, a publicist, you're looking at one of them. A modern world, a publicist is a law professor, essentially. Now, is that a good way to make international law? Now, I, I have to say, and I'm sure you've gathered, being at law school, that law professors have an enormous number of virtues. They are all these wonderful things about them, but being representative of their fellow citizens and standing in for a democratic process can hardly be among them. They're a rather eccentric bunch, to put it mildly. Well, indeed, we can actually show that they also don't, at least in the United States, represent the views of, uh, of American citizens at all. I did a study on uh, law professors at, uh, at uh, 20 of the top uh, law schools, and they represent 11 to 2, it goes 11 to 2 Democratic uh, in their campaign contributions. That's uh, bluer uh, than the bluest state uh, in the nation, sort of uh, comparable to the District of Columbia. It's a very unrepresentative uh, group. So that's a real Democratic deficit problem. The fifth democratic deficit is simply the distance of international law. I mean, Americans don't pay often a lot of attention to their government, but they pay a lot more attention to Washington than what's going on in Geneva, what's being negotiated internationally. So for all of those reasons, I think we should be very doubtful that international law should replace our law uh, in any respect. Uh, uh, because it just doesn't come from a process that is as good as a democratic process. And that means I think the court was wrong to take account of international law. Maybe it should have said under our own constitution that uh, juveniles couldn't get the death penalty, but it shouldn't have counted international law as a reason for that.
I may be wrong for the Obama administration or any administration uh, to be, feel bound by international law uh, that isn't uh, part of our law because there's no reason to believe that it's as good as our law. And so if the president has the discretion under our constitution or under a statute to interrogate with his agents uh, some accused terrorist, even if it violates some international law, he should do so. So that's there's some very practical uh, results of that. Now you might say, well, that the United States has to be part of the world. And I agree. There are other ways of doing that. There's nothing that I've suggested that suggests the United States should not enter into treaties. We should enter into treaties and agree to international law, but note that when we enter into those treaties and the Senate votes for them by two-thirds majority, or we actually pass a statute that tracks international law, if we do that, we've had the advantage of our democratic process, and there's nothing wrong with that. So it's pretty clear to me, at least for Americans, who have the advantage in our democracy of participating in it, international law we shouldn't follow when it can, unless our, we affirmatively make it part of our law. But you might think, well, that's all very well for Americans, but what about the point of view of international? People who are not part of the United States, who don't vote in U.S. elections, shouldn't they be interested in having the U.S. follow international law rather than our own law. And I would argue even then it's not such a good idea. And my argument about this is really in two parts. There are really two kinds you can think of international law norms. One kind of international law norm is exemplified by the case of Roper v. Simmons. Can't execute uh, juveniles, for instance. That's an international law norm that generally applies uh, uh, only, uh, uh, it doesn't have any spillover in any sense. There are really no international spillovers. In other words, nothing about executing juveniles in the United States really affects people outside the United States. We see now a lot of human rights international norms have that character. Despite the fact that there's no spillover from one nation to another, still the argument is you should follow international norms. And I think that's quite wrong because I think it's a tremendous advantage that a democratic nation like the United States uh, have, uh, make its own norms. Not only for us, and I've given reasons why it's a good idea for us, uh, because it comes to our democratic system, but it's a good idea for the rest of the world because we demonstrate, we, the rest of the world has a demonstration. Is our norm a good norm? And that's a real advantage to have a demonstration of norms and then other nations can decide, is it a good norm? They can adopt it. Or they can decide that we've got a really good set of norms and immigrate here. And of course, millions of people do each year. And, it's there, and that would be, I think, harmed if we allow international law to converge the United States norm to the norm of the rest of the world. We lose that distinctive American exceptionalism. And one example, of course, I give that is, let's go back to the founding of this nation. Well, the United States, when it declared these truths to be self-evident, those truths of how we should be governed, they were certainly not the norm back in 1776. They weren't the norm in Great Britain or Portugal or anywhere else. And yet we didn't believe that our difference here uh, should make it any less likely that our uh, views about this were right, and of course our demonstration of the virtues of a democratic system where everyone was equal under the law was so powerful that so many other nations adopted it. And so that's the advantage of American exceptionalism to contribute to the diversity of the world. So you might ask, well, there's a final question, though. I've given norms that where there really are no spillovers, but what about the decisions by the United States to use force against other nations? That does affect people in other nations. Our decision uh, to go to war in Iraq, our decision, if we have to, or uh, to attack Iran, to take out their nuclear weapons, assuming that negotiations don't succeed. That's a question that does deeply affect citizens in the rest of the world. 
Is that something we should follow international law? For instance, some people argue international law makes it illegal for the United States to take out Iran's weapons because it would be a preemptive attack. Let's assume the president says it's a good idea, even he gets authority from Congress, so there's no domestic problem. Should he be deterred by the argument, even the truth, that this would violate international law? And I think not, because even citizens around the world are helped by the U.S.'s following its own law rather than international law when the two conflict. Why? Well, I think there, uh, the reason for that is that uh, international law, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, is still very defective. It still doesn't get the right, uh, there's no reason to believe it as any sort of good kind of norm. On the other hand, even from the point of view of citizens of the world, the, the United States has an interest in providing uh, the uh, goods of peace and security more than any other nation because it gets the greatest share from peace and security. It gets the greatest share from the increased trade by policing the police and security of the law. In other words, the United States provides the public goods of peace and security. It's likely to have interests to provide those in a sensible way. Now to be sure, they're not as good not as good, perhaps, if we had a global government that voted on, uh, where citizens voted for a government and they decided on international law norms. But we don't have that. And we are nowhere near that uh, in the world today. And so that's the reason that it's not only the case that international law is better for Americans, it's better for citizens around the world. And that's why the United States does not only our own citizens a favor, but citizens in nations around the world will we remain true to our own democratic genius rather than follow the dictates of international law. I'd be happy to take questions. Yes. All right. So I have two questions. One, one of the art system is a common law system, uh, which which is bit, one of the basis is that our, a code doesn't necessarily or a law does not contain all the law within of itself. Does that make sense? So an act of Congress might not be all that is needed to determine how a case should go one way or the other. And so you take other pieces of law for persuasive authority, and why couldn't a court use that for persuasive authority? And especially, and this goes to my second question, the, the republicanism of treaties is a little bit complicated. Uh, Congress might choose not to adopt a treaty, not because it disagrees with its policies, but adoption of that treaty would interfere with the police powers of the state. That, uh, to take your example, Congress might have chosen not to uh, take the law uh, or ratify a treaty of juveniles like in death penalty because of respect to the states and how that is their decision. But if I'm in a state Supreme Court, why should I not be able to use that international law? Because the federal government has chosen for the police powers, for the state to have that police power. Okay, both of the <coughs> questions. First, I, I think I don't kind of accept the first premise of your question that we have a common law system. The federal really does not generally have a federal system, at least does not generally have a common law uh, system. I've generally been talking about what the federal government should do. Okay. So we don't have that, actually. We, there's no general federal common law. That's a principle, actually, of our uh, system. Now, your next question, I think there are really three questions there. One was, well, what about the persuasive authority of international law? Maybe we shouldn't say we're bound by international law, but we should take account of it. I'm not persuaded by that. Uh, here's the dilemma I would put to you. Either the, persuade, either the precedent is doing some work, either, in other words, either if the precedent is actually making it more likely that we should decide uh, uh, that the juvenile death penalty is unconstitutional, then I think we have all the same problems. Because if it's making it more likely, it's having some weight. And I don't see why it should have weight, given my problems with the democratic 
deficit of international law. If it's really not having any weight, I don't see what it's doing in the Supreme Court opinion. It's just confusing people, right? It's making us less transparent as to what's doing the work. So anything, if you think that persuasive authority, as I think you're suggesting, should means that the, uh, the precedent should have some weight, I still think it's up against the problem that you have to justify why it should have some weight. And given the defects of international law, I don't think there's any reason it should have any weight. Your third question is, well, what about uh, the uh, 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 if a treaty uh, has not uh, taken into account juvenile death or is not by, uh, uh, precluded the death penalty for juveniles because of respect for federalism? Well, I'd say that's, of course, the respect for federalist democracy. Uh, it's the case that all the arguments I made suggest that it's better for the state, either through their constitution or through their statutes, to make decisions about what happens to people in that state, rather than to follow some dictates of international law that are not democratic and that have no other uh, mechanism for us to make to believe they're good. So those would be my answers to your questions. You want to uh, come back? I have just one follow-up. If we follow your principle where if there's to take something that we have no control over and apply it to our law as persuasive authority is undemocratic and should not be allowed, then in the state level, we should not be able to go to another state of which we did not vote for, which we have no representatives for, and use their interpretation of the law in, in the state that we're living in currently. Is, is applying that same principle to the state between the different states, isn't that the same thing? I don't think it's quite the same thing. I certainly think that would be a good argument. A little, you'd have a slight concern about that, I think, that uh, particularly our state is distinctive. If we're down in Texas, we do things differently than the people in New York. I think they think, at least down in Texas, they do. Uh, and so I think that would be an argument against the it. But I think there's a big difference between uh, applying things uh, 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 in either international or foreign law uh, from borrowing things from one state to another. There's obviously a substantially greater convergence of ways of life in the, uh, in the state. So I think there's such a difference in the degree as to be almost a difference in kind there. Although I, I, I quite take your point, I'm not a great fan if I were uh, in Texas of importing New York uh, law, or if I were in New York of applying, importing uh, Texas law there, there seems to be a pretty great divergence in the way of life. If I could push you one more time and then I'll let everyone know. Then you're not saying that we shouldn't uh, allow international law as persuasive authority because international law is undemocratic. You're saying that we should not have international law because they're different. No, no, I'm saying that it is because it's undemocratic. You might think that because the uh, U.S. is, the people have such similar preferences, to go back to the reasons for democracy, that the votes of people in New York have some, uh, and the, the decisions of people in New York are pretty likely to help us understand what we think in Texas. That's the reason. So I think it can be put entirely within the democratic paradigm that I've outlined. Uh, yes, in the back, and then I'll okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you saying international law is made through nation states, not by individual. That's one nation. issue, yes, absolutely. Right. So what is, <clears throat> how do you see when the United States, by, or any other country, violates the law of another country, which Okay, well that's a different, that, that's if we violate foreign law, right? I want to make a distinction here. We could have a discussion, and indeed I wasn't entirely sure in the last question, what the question wasn't, well what about should we take as persuasive authority foreign nations' jurisprudence? We certainly could think about that. Foreign law is very different, and uh, I guess I can speak to that. I don't think the U.S. has any obligation <coughs> to, to obey foreign law, and I'll hear it even confess that when I was a government official, I wrote an opinion saying that the United States could go and essentially do what we just did in Libya. In fact, they're following, following the authority of the opinion. I hadn't thought of that until recently. They followed the authority of the opinion I wrote. We could go to other nations and kidnap people. Uh, and of course, that's against their law if it isn't against our law. 
So there's nothing uh, uh, that suggests that we should do that as a formal matter in our law. And that just follows, not really from anything I've said here, but from ideas of sovereignty. We're just not bound by other nations' law. And that, that I think is, I don't think that's a controversial uh, proposition. The Carter questions are, well, what if we enter into a treaty and agree not to go in and uh, take people other than through extradition? Those are hard questions, but I think it's pretty clear that we're not bound by the domestic authority of other nations. Yes? Uh, okay, <clears throat> I have a few uh, points <clears throat> to that. If, if the United States, by extension, does not obey lo laws of other countries. Correct. It, for instance, it's violating its own law because if no. I mean, the other countries have a law for the same reason as the U.S. does in itself, mm -hmm. which is no nation wants another nation to Correct. to at will to interfere its own affairs. So how, how we're not violating our own law, right? I mean, we're not. There's nothing in our law that says we can't go. Uh, we can, I mean, we could have a law, but we just don't have a law that says uh, executive branch officials who otherwise are authorized. I mean, the reason, of course, just to take this example in Libya, that we, we took this uh, uh, accused terrorist in Libya, we think he bombed some of our um, embassies. I think that's the reason. And so in general, of course, our executive branch has authority to go after such malefactors. And there's just no law that suggests that we have to follow other nations' laws. We could have such a law. Congress could pass such a law, but there isn't such a law. So that's the reason that it's, uh, it's legal for us under U.S. law to do that. And actually, I don't even think it's viol I'm not even sure it completely vi violates international law. I'm just not enough up on that. But in any event, so that's the reason. I think, again, I don't think it's a controversial proposition that we do not have to follow the laws of other nations, just as Libya, under its laws, doesn't have to follow our laws. Okay? All right, well, thank you. So that's, I think it's straightforward. And we could have a law that says follow all foreign nations' laws. We don't have it. Yes? If there were some sort of global or regional body that was directly elected by the people in that geographic area, would you have a different opinion uh, of the laws of that body than I you would. have right now? I think I would. I think that's an argument. Now, there are a lot of obstacles to having what would be called a global demos, and I think any global demos, I think, would be sensible in not having many laws telling us about what we have to have, at least democratic nations have to do with respect to individual rights. I think there's an important principle of subsidiarity that we shouldn't have uh, uh, a global uh, United Nations dictating zoning policy in Texas, right? That would be a very bad structure. But I'm not at all objective. I think it's important. I think it's a very nice question because there are some people who object to international law because of American sovereignty. That's just wrong because American sovereignty forbids us. To, and that's not my view. My view is about the welfare of individuals. And I think the welfare of individuals, particularly Americans, as I've argued, even people outside the United States, is not helped by tying the United States to international rules that we ourselves don't adopt. But my reasons for that are sound in democracy. And so if we actually had a functioning global democracy, if we were part of a region uh, that had a functioning regional democracy, at least within that region, I think we should then have good arguments for abiding by it. Yeah. The question I had, um, I remember reading in Con Law last year, Missouri v. Holland talking about, this is sort of related using international law, that when the Senate ratifies a treaty, based on the Supremacy Clause and then the holding in Missouri v. Holland saying that treaties that we sign on to can supersede the Constitution and the powers granted to Congress. And so Congress may not have the power um, in Article One, but if they sign on to the treaty, they have more powers. Can you kind of talk about that? Sure. Uh, and this is a case, it's a case that's before the Supreme Court called the United States versus Bond case. Let me give you the facts of the case. It's really quite extraordinary. 
The facts of the case are the United States entered into a chemical convention, an anti-chemical weapons convention. Of course, you, we've been hearing about chemical weapons in the news, and we've entered into a convention to ban them, right? So that's what we've been doing, and then we also have some verification provisions. And Congress passed the verification provisions to allow, make it a federal crime to own chemical weapons. So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the, to own or use chemical weapons. So that's the argument. After, so it passed the statute pursuant to the authority of the treaty. So here's what happened. There was a marital dispute. I'm not quite sure in what uh, state. But uh, one of the, uh, the wife, I think it was, to get back at her husband, put some deadly chemicals on the doorknob. So... Uh, there was a prosecution of this uh, spouse under a statute and passed to enforce the Chemical Weapons Convention. So already you can see, well, it's a little odd here, but the Chemical Weapons Convention seems to be about preventing nation states from using chemical weapons, the kind of thing we've seen in Syria, and now we've used it for a domestic violence dispute. So that's what's odd about it. And you might say there's a constitutional problem about it. There doesn't seem to be any interstate commerce connected to, and I think there was not really any, uh, uh, a this wife uh, putting the chemicals on the doorknob. So how could the federal government reach this crime? Well, the argument was they could do so pursuant to the statute, which was passed pursuant uh, to uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the treaty. So that's the argument that the federal government makes. Well, the argument against it is, there would be two kinds of arguments against it. Uh, one that's really more general. Both are, are uh, important kinds of arguments. One is the, the treaty power doesn't extend the federal government's powers in enumerated powers. So if the federal government couldn't reach this crime. Their treaty power, treaty, no treaty could allow the federal government. It could be a state crime, but no treaty could do that. The treaties can't uh, give the federal government any more enumerated power. That's one argument. Missouri v. Holland, the case that was just mentioned, says, indeed, the federal, the treaty power gives the uh, uh, federal government powers beyond the enumerated powers. That's actually not being challenged in this case. What's being challenged is, even if the treaty could do that, what the treaty can't do is authorize statutes to go beyond the Commerce Clause power. And there's a line in Missouri v. Holland that suggests it can, uh, but that's being reconsidered in the Supreme Court. And you might think the answers to those two questions should be different. Because, at least with, if, if it were understood in the treaty itself that gave this additional power to the federal government, that has to get two-thirds vote in the Senate. That's a hard thing to do. Whereas just passing a statute isn't such a hard thing to do. Uh, so that's uh, one, argument, one sort of practical argument. Another argument that's being uh, pressed is that uh, it's just not the case uh, that uh, this is necessary and proper uh, to the treaty-making power uh, because what's necessary and proper to the treaty-making power are only things that help the president make treaties. So, there's no, so necessary and proper, for instance, would be giving the president money or giving him authority to negotiate in certain ways, but there's not, this is, it's really a power to make treaties that the necessary and proper clause operates on, it doesn't operate on the treaty itself. And the argument for that, I think, is pretty good in this sense. It would be very bizarre otherwise. What if the United States, as a matter of international law, revoked the treaty? Would the statute remain? Or sort of like it's the, the grin on the Cheshire cat? Would that, would that happen? It's very perplexing to think uh, that, the, stat, that the, the treaty itself uh, can uh, 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 give power beyond the enumerated power, particularly when the Constitution remains, but the treaty, of course, could be repealed. So we'll see what the, the court says in that case of uh, this term. Yes? But as you might know, in Medellin versus Texas, the treaty was not enforced unless there, because it was not self-executing, unless there were statutes behind it. 
to the federal government who had this treaty that said that you have to treat cert uh, citizens of certain countries in certain ways if they get arrested, was not able to exert its power over Texas. This was in 2008, because there was no statutes following the treaty because the treaty wasn't self-executed. Right, that's a unique Now, exactly. so in that sense, in many ways, the statutes are absolutely necessary for the treaty to be enforced. But actually, I don't think that I kind of agree with you in this. Uh, I don't think the statute should be placed. I think the treaty should be assumed that they are self-executing, unless they're void for vagueness. And the reason why I think this is because in the supremacy clause of the Constitution, it does not separate the Constitution and treaties. They say both are the, excuse me, they do separate them out. They're both the supreme law of land, meaning the treaties do not go underneath the Constitution. The Constitution and the treaties are work together. And only if there's a conflict between the Constitution and the treaties do we need to try to weigh between the two. I think that's a really interesting argument. I'm not quite sure it gets you to where you want in this case, but I think it's an interesting argument. You're, again, let me just, for the rest of the class who may not be so familiar with the uh, self executing treaty, at the moment we have a structure in which uh, a treaty, even after it's enacted, uh, doesn't become sort of a rule of decision in U.S. courts unless we decide it's self executing and the court has to interpret the treaty and interpret what the Senate and the President did to decide whether there was an intention to make it self-executing. You might think that's a little odd. You might think that given the Supremacy Clause says that treaties are the supreme law of the land, that they are the supreme law, at least the presumption should be that, and unless they say it's not self-executing, or maybe they can't even not make it self-executing. That's the argument. All I would say there is that hasn't been the law for, oh, 150 years. There's been a requirement of actually looking at an intent of whether it's self-executing. So I think in the Bond case, the court's very unlikely to revisit that question. In any event, I'm not sure it gets you where you want uh, because uh, the, uh, it's not the case uh, that even if you make a treaty self-executing, that you would, um, given the authority uh, to issue the statute, unless uh, you said you were able to do additional things to bring this treaty into effect. You could make the treaty self-executing, and to be sure, it might uh, overwhelm the enumerated powers. Uh, maybe that's the case. But unless you have this view of the necessary proper clause that it operates on the treaty clause and gives you additional power to pass statutes, I don't think it follows that from the fact that the treaty is self-executing, that you should get this additional power. But I quite agree with you, and I think it's a very nice and very subtle point. Um, I'm an originalist. I think the Constitution should be interpreted according to its original meaning. And I think there is some argument for your position as an original matter that all treaties should be treated as self-executing, at the very least, unless Congress says, in so many words, they're not self-executing. And I think that's not a bad argument. It's not the law of today. Other questions? Surely there's some other challenges and thoughts. <laughs> oh, Mark, could you give a couple of examples of um, when courts have cited international law? I mean, you mentioned the, the Roe v. Simmons case is, I think, the most uh, important recent example of that. They also did something very similar to that. In the uh, Lawrence v. Texas case, they cited foreign law, the law of the EU, as a um, mechanism to suggest that it should, um, uh, the Constitution should be interpreted to prevent the, protect the rights of homosexuals, rights of certain, of certain kinds of, of sex. But, uh, so those are two uh, recent examples, examples within the last 10 years, so I don't think it's an academic issue at all. Uh, and then there are justices who regularly say we should look to international law. I think Justice Ginsburg, in a speech, said that uh, we should look to uh, international law because that, paraphrase of the Declaration of Independence, uh, is a decent respect for the opinions of mankind. Which, of course, is a phrase in the Declaration. As I try to suggest, though, if we had a decent respect for the general opinions of the rest of the, the, the elite, or at least the governing world, 
the Declaration of Independence would have been thought to be the outlier and perhaps should be suppressed. So I think it's quite ambiguous. So, so at the moment, uh, I would say there are these um, uh, examples of where the court has done that. There's been tremendous pushback. It's quite interesting to note that uh, when uh, uh, the um, uh, justices go before the Senate to be confirmed, uh, all of them are running away from using international law. That that's uh, uh, either even if they're nominated by uh, Democrats or Republicans, it doesn't seem to be a popular position. And I think there's been some uh, blowback, and I think maybe for some reasons that aren't so good, just some sort of nativist reasons, rather than I think the principled reasons to be against it. So it may be the case that those kinds of reasons might um, might uh, make the court less likely to use it in the future. I think it's important to look at the question of what's going to be good for Americans, what's going to be good for uh, people around the world in thinking about citing it, and that's why I'd like to put <laughs> put the opposition on a, on a foundation that I think is stronger than mere nativism, mere statement that we just don't like foreigners. That's not my position. I think we should have a lot of international treaties with people for mutual uh, matters. I think uh, foreign immigration to this nation is just a great thing. It doesn't come from any nativism. Uh, my worries about international law it comes from the fact that at least as it's currently structured, international law is, uh, uh, doesn't come from a good process, not least because people like me, law professors, do a lot of the making of it. That's tremendously frightening. Any other questions? Press my guess. Well, thank everybody for coming today. Oh, this is really exciting. Um, so again, thank you for coming. We have two more events scheduled for the fall semester. Both of them will be in November. On November 12th, um, we're teaming up with the National Security Society as well as the um, Federal Bar Association Student Division here on campus. We're going to be hosting a panel. We haven't uh, exactly narrowed down a time yet or a room, um, but the topic is going to be called National Security versus Civil Liberties, the Fourth Amendment in the Digital Age. So I mean, you think national the NSA, the wireless wiretaps, cell phones, tracking emails, all that sort of stuff will kind of be in play at that event. And then on November 20th, uh, the Federal Society is working with the Environmental Law Group here on campus. Um, we haven't narrowed down the topic quite yet, um, but it's going to be either on regulations, climate change, or things of that nature. So um, if you've signed up for our email list, um, you'll, or our Facebook page or Twitter, you'll be made aware of those events in due time. Um, but again, thank you for coming, and grab some pizza on the way out or a couple of beverages. So thanks again.